Back in our kitchen, Nick's shells have finished roasting in the oven. They're going to form the basis for a rich seafood oil. Whoa, that looks busy. Yeah. We've got root vegetables, celery, fennel uh, and carrot. And then we've got um, lemon zest, thyme, coriander, basil. We've got coriander seeds, fennel seeds uh, and cumin seeds. Mm. And uh, so, uh, there's some chilli in there for a bit of heat. Great. Oh, um, gosh. This is a lot of work for um, a very small part of the dish. Is that practical this... for 300 people? No, totally, because this will actually make enough langoustine oil in this one pot for 300 serves. Really? But you can't really make less, but it keeps for a month in the fridge. Decent olive oil. Nick finishes by drenching his ingredients in a good dose of olive oil and leaving it all to infuse for 45 minutes. Across the worktop, country house chef Tom Lewis is making a mayonnaise. It's the base for a horseradish and beetroot sauce to complement his starter of cured roe dip. All the ingredients come from close to home. Tom's home, of course. You know, horseradish, I mean, that's a great British thing, isn't it, really? Beetroot, got loads in the garden, really. <laughs> You know, and roe deer is, uh, you know, red deer, the moniker, the clan, and everything else, but roe deer is just a little bit sweeter, and for a starter, yeah, nice. His dish is cunningly easy to assemble. Now, Tom, I think this is rather clever, actually, because you haven't got that much to do. And if, you know, if you're feeding 300 people, preparing in advance is a bit of a good tip, I think. I think it's an excellent tip. Yeah. What have we got to do here, then? Beetroot. Really uh, how simple. How are you going to do? OK, I'm literally just going to roast them, keep all the flavours in. With the skins on? Skins on, absolutely. We'll peel them later on. Now, tell me about your venison. Ah, venison. Let's okay. have a look at it. Roe deer, to me, is a fantastic product, you know. Um, it's extremely sweet. It's very easy to work with. You cured yourself? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, anybody can do it at home. So it's from your back garden? Absolutely. Fantastic. Tom has lots of red deer on his land, but, as he said, he needs the more tender venison of the roe deer. They have plenty of those on a neighbouring estate, so he called on local deer stalker Black Dan to help track one down. Even though roe deer were on the verge of extinction in the 19th century, they're now abundant across wide tracts of Scotland. In fact, without any natural predators, they breed so well that an annual cull is necessary to stop a population explosion, which would lead to eventual starvation. Now, venison forms a substantial part of the income for most of the estates. For me, this is something that I can just go and do. And it's a wonderful feeling to be able to get so close to a wild animal. And especially if you can eat it afterwards. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's excellent. After an hour or so of patient stalking, Tom spots a couple of deer. <laughs> oh, that's a bit of a giveaway. But even professionals sneeze sometimes. Ah, oh, damn. <laughs> it takes a while, but eventually Black Dan does find Tom another deer for him to take back to his hotel. After it's been hung for 10 days, the deer's ready to be butchered under the watchful eye of Tom's niece. This is Georgina, my helpful assistant. Tom's finally able to remove the loin, which is just the cut he's after. It's really the easiest part of the animal to bone out. This meat is so tender, it's virtually coming off itself. Two loins of red deer, ready for curing. The curing is uh, drawing out all the moisture from the meat. And uh, so basically it's preserving it because it's all the moistures that make the, the meat rot, all the bloods and that type of stuff. So with a salt wine mix, it's pulling out and the flavour of the wine is being drawn into it. And you cure that now, three to five days. And the queen, she's going to love it. It's fantastic. 